Hey, welcome to Wednesday morning here at Next Gen Conference. I'm here with Austin Westlake. He's gonna be preaching later. He's kind of a big deal. Not a big deal, but I am gonna be preaching and I am honored to do so. And it is Wednesday, so we know a lot of you watching are gonna be having youth and children's services at your church tonight or maybe a prayer meeting. Whatever it is you've got going on in your community, your church, just know we've already been praying for your services tonight that God would move and miracles would happen. So it's gonna be a great night wherever you're at. And if you've been watching online the last couple of days, we've had Pastor John Lindell, we've had Peter Reeves, we've had Chad Gilligan, some profound, powerful yep. communicators. There's been workshops every day. So even though you're not here, you can pick up on some of that value and that content. If you know somebody that's here, I would say one of the biggest things that you can get from them is the practical training that they've received during the numerous workshops on children's ministry, youth ministry, and young adult ministry. That's right. Take advantage of what your friends have learned if they've been here in the workshops because there's been some great things that have been shared. And it's been like a big family reunion, right? The Assemblies of God is like a big family. And so there have been family from all over the country hanging out in Orlando. It has been amazing. Last night, we had an amazing youth leaders outing. We also had a children's leaders outing. I hope everybody here got some sleep. It's a late night, but such a great night. Everybody hanging out, having fun, eating good food. And if you're following online, please follow our social media platforms. You've got AG Kids, you've got AG Youth, you've got the Called Initiative, you've got AG USA. That's a lot of social media that to is, be we're following. everywhere. It could really throw off your algorithm, probably in a good way, if you were to follow right. all those right now. That's right, you probably should. That way you don't miss anything that's going on across the Assemblies of God. Remember, we're a network of 13,000 churches in America, so there's a lot of different things going on. I guarantee you there's something that you can find that's valuable for your church and your community. Well, Austin, you know, the service that you're gonna be speaking today started with a conversation about saying, we wanna have a children's emphasis speaker, that was Chad Gilligan. We wanna have a young adult emphasis speaker, that was Peter Reeves. And you are our youth emphasis speaker. And that's because myself and so many others just see an anointing on your life from the time you were a youth pastor to a district youth director, and now in the national office. Give us a little preview of what you're gonna be sharing and how people can prepare their hearts yeah. for the message today. Yeah, this has been a message that I've been excited about, looking forward to for a long time. And really, I just believe that every Every leader, regardless of age or stage of life that we're in right now, all of us are fighting battles that other people know nothing about. And oftentimes we try and fight the battles ourselves, but the truth is the battle doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the Lord. We just have to be still and trust him that he's gonna go before us and his Holy Spirit is gonna do the heavy lifting. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about that today, believing that uh, God is gonna fight our battles for us and do things for us we could never do for ourselves. And for those of you who are watching, we love that you're here. So don't forget to like, subscribe, all those things. But more importantly, if you've got a prayer request, if you've got a praise report, if you have something you wanna share personal, type it down there in the comments right. and share it with the others that are watching online. Be part of this community from right there from where you are. Yep, we'd love to celebrate whatever God is doing in your life. Even though you might not be in the room, you're with us in spirit and you're definitely a part of the family and we wanna celebrate with you. All right, well, you gotta get ready for service. I do. Stay, keep watching. How's everybody doing this morning? Anybody lose your voice like I did? <laughs> it's all good, it's all good. But I do feel like I don't wanna be lonely up here. So I'm thinking we just need to, you know, just come, let's be together, you know, let's come be together. So I don't know why somebody would go to the back row at a conference like this, but it's fine, because we do have to fill up all the chairs, right? But if you wanna come, all the way to the front, you know what I'm saying? Come on, don't leave me hanging now. <laughs> oh, man. We could probably just have a testimony service right now, right? Anybody been touched by the Lord this, this week? Come on, man. I mean, I, I hope you got lots of ideas and, and all kinds of things, but I hope one of the biggest ideas you got was for your secret place. Right? I mean, come on, man. We got to move in power, right? Remember the first night? God, help us. Fill us with your power. And, and teach us to pray, God. Come on. Can we just begin to lift up our hands all over this place? Oh, we love you, Jesus. 
I also asked some of my guys to help me sing this morning, so they're going to help us lead, but we're just going to worship the Lord. We're going to give Him all the glory. God, we just come to you this morning. Thank you, Lord. Just begin to lift up your voice. Give Him glory. There's no lyrics on the screen, but you have a song in your heart. You have a song in your heart. is my firm foundation the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking come on lift your voice this morning say I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus he's never let me down he's faithful to Jesus So I would keep feel now He won't play. He won't I've still got joy in chaos I've got peace and makes no sense So I won't be going under I'm not here, not here
It's an amazing and beautiful declaration as we sing to realize that we don't even own the breath in our own lungs. And truthfully, you don't even own your lungs. We are His. And there's a generation that doesn't understand what it means to say, this is not my life. Right? Everything's mine. <laughs> It's mine, it's my phone, iPhone, mine, it's my life. Come on, next gen, we gotta teach this next generation that we don't own anything. 
We don't own the breath in our lungs. We don't own our lungs. We don't own our lives. In fact, not only do we not own our lives, we will be held accountable for how we use the life that he has given us. We rest in your presence. We rest in your presence, Lord. Oh, yeah, yeah. Rest in your presence. Oh. Thank you, Lord. And thank you, thank you, beautiful Savior. Thank you. Thank you, a selfless sacrifice. Thank you, thank you, beautiful Savior. Through all that you've done, you have poured out your love. So we sing thank you, thank you, thank. One more time, sing thank you. We sing thank you, thank you. Beautiful Savior, thank you, thank you, a selfless sacrifice, thank you, thank you, beautiful Savior, through all that you've done, you have poured out your love, so we sing thank you, thank you, thank you. must have been so I could be free how heavy your heart to carry sin so I could be
Take a couple minutes and just begin to thank him for specific things in your life. Thank him for everything he's been doing this week. Come on, begin to thank him, give him praise. Come on, he's put plans in your heart. He's put changes in your heart. He's put new directives in your life. Begin to thank him in advance for what he's going to do. Come on, let's lift up this, this roar of the thanks. Come on, begin to open your mouth with thanksgiving to our God. Sing that chorus one more time. Thank you, thank you, beautiful Savior. Thank you, thank you, selfless sacrifice. Thank you, thank you, beautiful Savior. Through all that you've done, you have poured. Through all you've done, through all that you've done, you have poured out your love again. Through all that you've done, you have poured out your love. So we say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. God, we give you praise and we thank you this morning. You are good. Come on, can we thank him this morning? Can we thank our God? Can we thank our God? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's just thank him. Let's just thank him for another moment here. All across this room, if you would just lift your hands and close your eyes, and let's have a moment of thankfulness. Church, even the world recognizes the power of thankfulness. How much more the children of God should spend a moment of thanksgiving as we prepare our hearts for an impartation of the word and the spirit. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be together. We thank you for the calling that, Lord, it sometimes is a burden, but, Lord, you said your, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And in this moment, Lord, we feel the lightness. And, God, we give thanks for the calling you've placed on our lives. We give thanks for the fellowship that you've put us in. And that, Lord, our commitment to reaching the lost is equal to our commitment for caring for each other is equal. Maybe not equal, Lord, but the only thing greater in our commitment is our praise and adoration of you, O oh God. So, Lord, we do thank you. Holy Spirit, you already have the authority here. We just submit to it. We thank you for that authority. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. Head on back to your seats. Touch somebody on the shoulder. Say, I am thankful that you're here. As you're making your way to your seats, I just want to direct your eyes to the screen. What is a woman? Well, Can you tell me what a woman is? No, I can't. Because but it's not for me to say.
gender dysphoria is not to rearrange the skin on our bodies to match our fallen mind. The answer is to renew our mind to match the body that the Creator gave us. cultural crisis. The enemy is preying upon our most valuable treasure, the next generation. One out of every five students is embracing an LGBTQ identity, and we can't afford not to be prepared to give them an answer for the hope that we have and to train our students how to respond to their peers. Join us at Restory 24 and bring your staff pastors, bring your parents, bring your volunteers. Together, we can take our stand and push back against the cultural tide that is indoctrinating our sons and daughters away from the truth. We have a next-gen sale that's going on today through Friday. You can save 40% off your registration. Our students are worth the investment for you and your team to get equipped. I hope to see you on Friday, October 4th, in Indianapolis. So good, so good. Thank you, Dr. Seiler. And I'll just add this from my seat uh, in, the, in the youth department as I travel. I would just say this to every next-gen worker uh, in this room. And I heard Dr. Seiler say it yesterday. None of us, shame on us if we don't have a resource at the ready for parents, for families, for students as they step into this issue. It is the defining issue of this generation. We're not thankful for that, but we are thankful for the power of the Holy Spirit to transform lives, to give us resources to help rescue the lost. Amen? Amen. 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 Dr. Seiler is one of us, uh, AGTS, Chi Alpha, and so we're just so, so, so thankful for the miraculous work in her life. We're even more thankful that she's one of us so that we can be resourced to reach a generation. Amen? Amen. Hey, one of, the, one of the things that we're celebrating today, and we don't, listen, we don't want to take up time with something that's not valuable, but we, want, we think that this is a resource that's going to add value to you. We talk about longevity and ministry passively because the reality is even those of us who said, man, I'm going to stay in this church till I retire, the Lord transitions us at different times. We've heard different statistics about the longevity of children's and youth pastors in local churches, and oftentimes there's nothing really authoritative that uh, speaks into that. It's anecdotal at best. I think I heard a study. I'm not sure I read this on the internet. 18 months seems to be the longevity of a youth pastor, things like that. Well, one of our own, once again, the Dr. Lee Rogers, did some research and has something authoritative to say, and his most recent published work is being released at this conference. So I'm going to invite him to the stage. Hey, buddy. He doesn't like it when I call him doctor, but he's one of my, he's, this is one of my best friends, and I love, love, love teasing him about that, uh, mostly because when I have a question for a smart person, this is who I text. So anyway, Lee, talk to us about this resource. Yeah, and uh, so, you know, one of the myths we hear out there about longevity and next-gen ministry is really popular in youth ministries that a youth pastor only stays in the same church 18 months. Do you know vocational youth pastors, people who are called and do it for a living, the average is actually four years, but I want to challenge you today, that's not enough. It's not enough. In fact, here, I want you to just consider next-gen pastor, kids pastor, youth pastor, young adults pastor. When you have a short tenure at your church, when you don't start with the end in mind, when you don't say, I'm going to be here at least 10 years, the consequences of that are almost incalculable, not just for your own life, but for the mission of God. Because when you came to that church, you probably said, God called me here. You probably get up on Wednesday nights or Sunday mornings and say, God gave me this message. So you begin to train and teach your kids and youth, boy, this is God's representative to me. And when you leave before it's time, you also model and teach students that God's not reliable. 
And they transfer the mistrust they have for the church or the ministry to God himself. Friends, if God has called you to a place, you've got to make a commitment to become the kind of person who can stay rooted in your call. We interviewed, we surveyed over 79 Assemblies of God next-gen pastors who had been in their church five years or more, so exceeding the current standards of longevity. And we interviewed 24, and we identified what people have in common that helps them stay rooted in your call. And I just want to challenge some of you today. You think your pastor's the problem. You think your church is the problem. Let me just challenge you. Those things are out of your control. You need to look in the mirror and say, what do I need to do to change, to stay rooted where God's called me? And Lee, I know there were a lot, there were, you mentioned the myth of longevity. So yeah. you said that it's closer to four years, not 18 months. Yeah. I had 18 months thrown at me just last week by a pastor. No, no there's no research basis him, but... for that. It's a myth. It, we like it. It sounds, oh, yeah, but we got dis- a real problem, but it's a myth. And you discovered quite a few myths in your research. A lot of myths. People believe People believe the myth that you have to be young to be effective at next-gen ministry. Listen, Moses was not young when he took a teenage Joshua and made him his intern. Okay, Eli was not young when he taught Samuel how to listen and respond to God. Jesus was in his 30s when he got a group of mostly teenage disciples together. And Paul was not young when a 12- or 13-year-old Timothy began to travel around the ancient Mediterranean with him. No matter what age you are, you can be effective. And I just got to add, this you don't even have to be cool listen I think we all want to look good but when you are hyper obsessed about your image you're modeling materialism for your students you're teaching them that God values appearance over what's in here and worst of all you are isolating people who can't afford to be cool from coming into your group You don't have to be cool, you have to be young. You don't have to be a man. In fact, a huge percentage of people in our study were female. A huge percentage were single. God calls all kinds of people. We've identified at least 15 myths in this book. Uh, But it's not just about the myths, Josh. It's about what you need to make it long-term. Personal adjustments, relationships you need in your life. What you need from the Holy Spirit. There's even a whole chapter full of questions you need to ask a pastor, a church board, a youth leadership team to help you realize whether or not the church you're interviewing at is the church you're called to. So we want to encourage you to pick this up. It would make a great small group uh, material for youth pastors and leaders or kids pastors in your section in your area and your network so yeah one of the notes that I've, per- I've already quoted after having read your book was that the most valuable relationship that an next gen pastor has in the church after the holy spirit is their lead pastor yeah it doesn't matter how successful your youth ministry is if you have con resolved conflict with your lead pastor it's only a matter of time till you're done at that church time. you've got to learn how to get along how to resolve you don't have to be best friends but you've got to have a positive relationship amen Hey, and let me just say this about this guy personally. When you see him, would you congratulate him on not, listen, getting a published work is exciting. All of us who have sat in your seats where you're sitting right now think, man, I think I've got a published work in me. But let me just congratulate you on doing the work to do the research and then to sit down, spell it out in a way that's easy for guys like me to process and to understand. Yeah, and just to say, this is not just a dry research book. There's stories powerful stories, not just my story, stories from the people we interviewed and interspersed throughout that are pro tips from next-gen, vetted next-gen leaders and directors across the nation from our fellowship to help contribute to your success and your call. Thank you for helping us with that. Appreciate it. Thanks, Lee. (laughs) Show some love as he goes back to his seat, or you're going to stay up here with me. You're going to stay? Yeah, because speaking of longevity, we have an amazing thing to do Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, speaking of longevity... We all aspire to it. I think my first couple years in youth ministry, I would see the, the seasoned youth workers be like, man, I'm going to be like that one day. And uh, I don't know if I'm there yet, but I'm still looking at guys ahead and gals ahead of me who are serving longevity. We wanted to give an award today to one of those that's here. It's one of us. Uh, and he doesn't know that I'm about to call him up. But I just want to say this. I don't know, I don't know that there's one silver bullet to longevity. Lee's done some research to help us get there. 
But I will say this. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. And my, my advice is, you just got to keep coming back for more. And one of the people that I've learned this from is the man I'm about to invite up here. Many of you have had him in your districts and networks. Uh, he's been a professor at North Central University. He's been a church planter. Uh, he's from Michigan. And so I have somewhere, I, I, I put away somewhere in the di Michigan district archives his gospel singing album on vinyl that was recorded in the 80s at a district youth convention. And at this point, and he's got his mullet uh, in full, full view on there. And at this point, he's probably figured out who he is. Uh, so without going any further, I can't see over there if he's pointing at himself. Jeff and Jessica Grinnell, I'm gonna invite you up to this stage. And along with you, I'm gonna invite all of the national Next Gen directors up. Jay and Laura, Kelly, Kim, Holly, Carl. If you're here, guys, come on up. <laughs> Pastor Rick and Rita, Doug, would you come on up as well? This is... We just want you to help us honor Jeff and Jessica here. Come on over here, guys. Yeah, we can stand right over here in the center. Ah, you're crying. That was the goal. Hey, I love you. Uh, yeah, no, it's not fair. I blindsided this guy. I blindsided this guy. But listen, you, you blindsided me a couple times. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, your influence in the Michigan district was huge. When I, when I moved there as a young youth pastor, I quickly learned that yours was a ministry I needed to lean into. You were planting a church in Grand Haven, Michigan, and I saw young leaders everywhere who'd been influenced by your investment. So I was onboarded a little later, but there's probably people all over this room that we might call protégés or are producing fruit from seeds that you sowed into their ministries. We chose one of them who very specifically you invested in, and now he's one of us in the national office. And so is he behind me here? Or are we gonna bring him up? Okay. Well, I mean, here's what I need to say about this guy. North Central student who also uh, served at James River Church, served with Hillsong Church, and now is one of our most um, charismatic and anointed communicators in our lineup of young leaders who are out there reproducing themselves but this guy's a result of your ministry. And Steve, come on over, uh, because uh, you have something special to say, and then we have something special to give you. So I'm not going to look at you, uh, but Jeff, you have been uh, an investment in so many. And I vividly remember going to North Central University in 2005, not knowing what I was going to do with my life. Started out in business and felt like God was doing something, but I really wasn't sure what that looked like. I remember uh, close to 20 years ago is when you came to North Central, and I remember walking into a gym. It was preseason for basketball, and there's open gym going on, and all of a sudden, uh, there's a handful of new guys. Don't know if they're, you know, going to be on the team or not, and all of a sudden, there's you, and I'm like, who's, who's this guy? And you're out there, and you know, you're, you're hooping with us. And then all of a sudden afterwards, I remember meeting you and you just said, my name's Jeff. And a couple days later, I head into my youth class and who's my professor? You. And I'm like, yo, that's the guy that I was just playing ball with a few days ago. And I began to watch over the next few years, how you just did life and ministry and how you just love students so deeply, so passionately and challenged all of us not just in the youth department, but really at North Central to just walk in the call that God has on our life. I'll never forget February 13th, 2007, when I felt like God really confirmed that call and processing some of that with you over the years. And just the investment that you made, not only in my life, but countless others. Even as I look at a room like this, there's probably many that have been encouraged by what you've done. And I'm grateful for you. I remember you saying a few things 
in our classes that have just stuck with me forever that I just kind of like uh, have stolen and share with other people. <laughs> I tell them I learned this from you. You don't just pastor a youth ministry, a church, you pastor the city. If you're not on the school campus, you're not doing youth ministry. You don't just read the word, you live the word. And probably the single greatest thing that has stuck with me that I've just committed to carry on that legacy that I've learned from you is your commitment to the word of God, to prayer, to fasting, to your spiritual disciplines. And I'll never forget, Jeff, hearing you say one of your favorite things to do is be able to take a Bible that's yours and where you go through it front to back, fill it with notes, fill it with highlights, camp messages, things, and and I just remember hearing you say that and thinking, man, that is amazing. The, the passion that you have for the word of God, but the generosity that you have to be able to give your very Bible to someone that's not even in your bloodline to be able to say, hey, this is a legacy piece, but I see something in you. And I just remember in 2011, coming back from a trip to Israel with you, sitting in JFK airport, and you handed me this Bible. And I wanted to just read one verse from Titus 2, actually two verses, I'm sorry. Six and seven, in the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely. To you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. I love what it says in another translation. It says, doing it yourself. You've modeled it. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and the serious of your teaching. Jeff, I'm grateful for the investment that you've made. I've just made a decision to carry on that legacy. Where I remember that impacted me so much that I've just made a decision. I'm going to do the very same thing to other young men. To be able to see a call that God's got on their life. And to be able to, to say, you know what, I see it in you. And you might not even see it right now yourself, but I'm going to pull out the gold that's inside of you. And you've done that for countless people. And for that, I'm grateful. And today, we wanted to give you a Bible in the same way that you've done for so many others, filled with notes and highlights and encouraging messages to let you know your race is not yet done. It's so cool to see the legacy that you've lived and you guys live together as you just lead and love students. One thing that you would say, no one loves students more than me. You want to give it a try? Come and chase after me. Well, I'm here to tell you, Jeff, I'm still trying to love students as much as you do. And so what we wanted to do as a team is give you this Bible as a way of just saying thank you for your legacy. Thank you for all that you've done. And keep on running your race. And Jess, we got something for you as well because you guys are a team. This isn't just something that Jeff is doing. This is something that you guys are doing. And both of you run we wanted to get you a pair of running shoes to, just as a symbol of saying, keep on running. I love what it says in Acts 20, 24. Paul says, my life's worth nothing unless I run this race, complete this task, testifying to the goodness, the gospel of our God. Keep on running your race. Your best days are still ahead. There are so many people that are going to be in heaven instead of hell because of what you guys are doing, the investment that you're making. And I can't wait to see one day in heaven who's been impacted by Jeff and Jess Grinnell. Come on, can we stand to our feet all across this place as we just honor Jeff and Jess for the investment that they've made for all of these years. We love you guys. We're grateful for you and for all that you've done. We love you. We're going to pray over you, and I would ask that you guys just extend your hands, and we're going to have Pastor Come on, Jake. stick your hands out this way. Father, we praise you, and we thank you for these incredible godly leaders. Lord, they model, and they lead. Lord, he operates in gifts, oh God, that have been blessings to not only us, but even sons and daughters, God, of us. Father. They have brought home run hitters into the kingdom to be able to do your work in some of the most trying 
and meeting places. And no place, O oh Lord, is really complete without your servants carrying your gospel. And this couple sends your servants. They do what Peter did. They do what Peter Reeves preached last night. They get on their knees and they call for workers in the harvest. And then they raise them up, Lord, as you taught us to do. So be it, God, that you give to this couple a brand new Louisville Slugger bat to hit more home runs Oh, God, let them swing for the fence, even right now, how desperately we need it. But thank you for their legacy. Thank you for their leading. We praise you for them, and we celebrate them in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give the Lord praise. Thank you, God. didn't see the pictures up there. <laughs> Love you. Thankful for you. Wow. It's guys like that and women like that that set the bar pretty high for the rest of us that are, uh, all of us are drinking from wells that others have, have dug. And certainly in the area of student ministry, uh, the Grinnells are, are famous for having done that. They set a very high bar. Our guest speaker, <laughs> guest speaker, I think we're all guests here. Uh, you know, Doug, Doug Clay models something in his leadership that he calls reverse mentoring. Uh, he's not just looking for young leaders that he can utilize to prop up the organization or to make us look good or, or to bring energy where energy is needed. He's looking for the future because no matter how far you get in this journey, God still wants you to be part of the future of what he's building in the church. And so something that the guys in the national office are always doing is looking for those reverse mentors, those who maybe in years are behind us in the journey and in years of experience, their resume is a little bit shorter than ours. And one of, them, one of those that the Lord revealed to not just myself, but to others a few years back, was a young man in Kansas City who'd been youth pastoring in the inner city and had a special calling on his life. Just a couple of years ago, he joined us in the national office as the director of student discipleship, overseeing ministries that you are very familiar with, fine arts, team Bible quiz, added very quickly Assemblies of God basketball to our National Youth Conference lineup because he cared not just about student artists, but student athletes as well. He knows that the discipleship model must include everyone. He had the honor of being the youngest speaker at our general council last August. And the last six months have been a wild roller coaster. He's going to tell you a little bit about that. His wife, Lauren, is here. They have three amazing children. So please give a warm welcome to one of my favorite preachers. Ladies and gentlemen, Austin Westlake. Massive honor to get to be here this week at all. I don't take these moments for granted. If I didn't take them for granted a year ago, I certainly don't take them for granted right now. The presence of the Holy Spirit has been in this place. If you were here last night and you heard Pastor Peter Reeves and you got to respond to the word that was brought into to the presence of God in this room, then you know that the Lord has been with us. We've been visited by the Holy Spirit. Been visited by the Holy Spirit. I really believe that God wants to do a unique thing in this service today. I'm aware that we have flights to catch. I'm aware that we have to get on the road. I'm gonna be cognizant of that. But I really believe that God wants to do something else before we leave today. Not because I'm here, not because there's a band that's here, not because executive leadership is here, but because the Holy Spirit is in this room. The Holy Spirit is in this room. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I really believe he wants to do a unique thing. But I just would be remiss if I, if I didn't do one thing. Um, 
before we really get into the message. I want to take a moment and, and as we talk about reaching the next generation and we lead the next generation and we pray for the next generation and the next generation keeps us up at night and gets us up early in the morning, we have to take a moment and honor the generation that has set us up to win. We have to. We have to. Pastor Rick and Rita, would you just stand for a moment? Obviously, I, I love you and respect you, uh, not just because you're one of my bosses, but because of the man of God that you are and because of the, uh, the way that you all have parented and, and, and leadership that, that you've exemplified. But I just, I really sensed, I don't know if this is a word from the Lord or if it's some, something that I'm feeling, but I, I want to say it to you. I felt like I needed to. That our generation is going to have enemies that will not show up at our doorstep because some of them have been taken care of during your generation's leadership. We will have enemies of our own. We will have battles of our own. But I really believe there are some battles that will not show up at our doorstep because they're giants that you took down. Because these are nations that you went into. Because these are enemies that you took out. And you constantly tell us that you're praying that the Lord allows you to live long enough to see the revival happen in the next generation. I hear you say that over and over, and I know that you really believe it. But I just want you to know that we recognize the blessing that you have been to us. We recognize that, that your leadership is unique. I recognize that the only reason we get to lead the next generation is because we had a previous generation that set us up and went and defeated some enemies and cleared the way. And I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful for your leadership, and I just felt led to pray over you today. Seeing as you're over all of church ministries and the assemblies of God, I just sensed that we needed to pray, and we need to ask the Lord to bless you, and that the latter years would be greater than the former. I really believe that. We're grateful for the giants that you've taken down. We're grateful for the land that you have taken, and we just want to pray a blessing over you right now as you extend a hand. Oh, God, we're so grateful for these leaders. God, I pray right now that you would bless them and their family tenfold. God, you've seen everything every sacrifice that they have made. You've seen every early morning they've spent in prayer. You've seen every late night that they have stayed up travailing, asking you to move in the next generation. God, you've seen all of the battles that they have fought, making a way so that the next group of leaders could disciple those who come after them. In Jesus' name, I'm asking that you would bless them, that you'd give a fresh anointing, that you'd bless all the initiatives that they're leading and that they're a part of. And God, would you give them a fervent energy, got a fresh energy and renewed spirit to continue leading in the capacities that you've called them to lead in. And God, I pray that you would help him to see miracles in his life. Help Rita to see miracles in her life. They'd see miracles in their family, miracles through their ministry, in every place that their foot would go. Would your Holy Spirit go ahead of them and make the way in Jesus' name? And everybody said, amen and amen. Come on, can we make some noise for our leadership? Because they've taken risks. And I also know we've got our general superintendent in the room. I love you. Respect you so very much. Not because you're the boss of bosses, but because I know your character and your integrity. I know who you are. You're the real deal. You're the real deal. We love and appreciate you. And to the, the next-gen team that I get to be a part of, and, and my leader, Pastor Josh Wellborn, I love you. Thanks for taking a chance on me and on the next generation. Appreciate all of you so much. Glad we get to do this together and I'm glad to be with you. Really believe that God wants to speak to us today. If you got a Bible, go ahead and get your Bible out and we are going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 today. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's in the Old Testament, if you didn't know that. <laughs> I know we're tired. We were up late last night, so we might've forgot. But 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 20. As Pastor Josh said just a few moments ago, um, I have the unique honor of serving as the Director of Student Discipleship in the Assemblies of God, and it is a huge honor. It is one that I don't take lightly. I take it very seriously, sometimes too seriously probably. I need to have a little bit more fun, but I love what we get to be a part of, and I say we because I've got an amazing family who's on this journey with me. I think we've got a picture of my family uh, that, we can, that we can throw up there on the screen. That is my amazing family right there, and uh, standing next to me, is my wife, Lauren. She's actually here with us as well. She's in the room, and so uh, so glad that her and I get to do life together. She is my greatest gift. Outside of salvation, she's one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given me, and I just, I love her so very much. Lauren, I love you.
And then we've got amazing kids. Uh, she's holding on to the stroller right there, my son Tate, who's actually the only child who's with us this week, praise God. We have our son Tate, and, uh, and uh, how many of you are parents in the room, by the way? Raise your hand if you're a parent. Okay, good. That, that just helps me, so I know who I'm talking to. Um, so we're grateful for Tate. He was born on my birthday, October 15th, this past year. Such a blessing. Tate Austin is his name. I was only allowed to name him Tate Austin because he was born on my birthday, so I felt like the Lord just smiled on me in that way. And then standing over there on the opposite side, the little girl right there is our daughter, Quinn. She is three years old, and I am not exaggerating when I say this. That girl desperately needs Jesus to do a work in her life, okay? We are, like, she needs to respond to an altar call. So you know, uh, we're believing for her salvation. She is on another level. I, I thought my son was preparing us. No, my daughter, I mean, it, it's just another level, okay? So pray for us. Pray for us. Uh, yeah, she needs the Lord. So we're praying for her. So she's cute, but she knows she's cute. That's part of the problem. And then standing in front of me right there is my son, Jude, who just turned seven years old, big seven-year-old guy. And uh, he, is, uh, he is such a joy, brings so much laughter, brings so much fun into our household. Just so grateful that God allowed us to become parents when we had Jude. We really felt like he was a miracle baby after some difficulties that we had getting and staying pregnant. And we just are so grateful for Jude. And Jude is in first grade, big man on campus. And uh, he, uh, he recently, this was several weeks ago, um, we were spending some time with Jude before putting him to bed. And uh, just before going to bed, we're just talking with him. The other kids are asleep and just getting to have some alone time with Jude. And as we're talking with him, he stands up on his bed. He starts jumping up and down on his bed. You know, kids always get the most hype right before they're supposed to go to bed, right? All of you know exactly what that's about. And so he's jumping up and down on his bed, and, and he goes, ah. Oh! And we're like, that's kind of dramatic. What, what's going on? And he holds his stomach. He's like, ah. Oh! So what, what's going on? He said, my stomach hurts. I'm like, oh, do you, you need to use the restroom before bed? You need to go to the bathroom before bed, bud? Because you, know, you need to probably do that before you get in bed. He says, no, no, my stomach hurts because this kid punched me in the stomach. I said, hold on. You said a kid punched you in the stomach. What, what do you mean by that? Like physically punched you? He said, yeah, this, this kid at school, he, he, he punched me in the stomach. We said, okay, um, how long ago was this? He said, I was a couple days ago. I said, a couple days ago, and you didn't think to tell us that somebody punched you in the stomach? I said, does he do this to other kids, or is it really just you? He said, well, it's, it's really just me. He, he's kind of mean to me. He's not very nice. And yeah, he recently punched me in the stomach. And so we're trying to stay calm, right? Lauren and I are trying to hold it together, trying not to overreact. We don't want him to overreact. So we're just asking some basic questions like, what are his parents' names? How do they take their coffee? Do they have good health insurance? Do they have a good lawyer? You know what I mean? Like the basic questions, like who do they know that we might know? You know, just all of those questions, trying to get to the bottom of who this individual is and more importantly, who his family is. And so we're trying to get to the bottom of the situation. Don't want to make a big deal about it, but we, we put him to bed. And then a few days later, we're at a family gathering. And at this family gathering, it comes to the surface that Jude has been punched in the stomach. And immediately, someone else who was at the family gathering was like, Jude, did you punch him back? I said, no, no, he, he did, Jude, no, you, he did not punch him back. The guy was like, you got to punch him back. If somebody punches you, you, you have to stand up for yourself. You have to punch them back. I'm like, no. I turned to Jude. I'm like, no, you're not going to punch them back. Like, that's not... That's not how we roll. That's not what we're going to do. That's not how this is going to go down. I'm going to go into the school and talk to the teacher on Monday. I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to take care of this for you. Jude, you know you're going to have to be kind. You're going to have to be nice, but you're not going to have to do much. I'm going to go in, and I'm going to take care of this. The moment I realized there was a fight against my son, the fight no longer belonged to my son. The fight belonged to me. It did not take long for me to, to think to myself, this is not my son's fight. This is actually going to be our fight. We're going to do this together. In fact, it's going to be my fight. I'm going to carry the weight and the burden of this. I'm going to handle the situation. And we told our son, you just need to be kind. You need to be respectful. You need to be nice. Do what we've taught you to do. But son, this is not your fight. This is mine. I'm going to take care of it for you. I want to preach a message today. And if I had to give it a title, it would be this, not my fight. Taking notes, you can write that down. Not my fight. And the reason why I really wanted to bring this specific message today is because I think that there are a lot of us, many of us in this room, who are currently fighting some battles and trying to own some battles that if we were really honest about it, we know deep down are not our battles to fight. They're not our battles to own. And because we are leaders, 
And because we're assertive and because we want to take charge, there are some moments that we feel that we've got to do something. We've got to act. We've got to take action and initiative and responsibility. And there will be moments when all of those things are true. But I also believe there are moments when the Lord wants to fight a battle for us that we could never fight for ourselves. See, when we try to own a battle that we're not meant to own, we end up with a result that we were never supposed to get. The Lord wants us to trust in him. I believe the word of the Lord today is that it's not your fight. You have a Savior who's fighting on your behalf. I really believe that. Are there things we're going to have to do? Yes, we've all got a part to play. There's obedience we have to walk in. There's steps that God's going to have us take. But I honestly believe that every single one of us has maybe one or many battles in our life that we're trying to own that we were never meant to own. And we're trying to plan our way into a victory that we actually need to pray our way through. And we're trying to strategize our way into a victory that can only come through the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I believe in strategy. That's why we did breakouts. But I also believe in the power of the Holy Spirit going before us and doing miracles. And we cannot strategize our way into a victory that can only be won by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts of angel armies. It's not our fight. There will be moments when God has us fight in different ways, but it's not our fight. The Apostle Paul is very clear that there's a good fight of faith to fight, but there are battles that come our way that we have to give to the Lord because we won't win them if we try to fight them on our own anyways. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's right around 100 years after King David had left the throne. There's a divided kingdom in Israel. You know your Bible. I don't need to give you all the details, but the southern kingdom of Judah is being led by a man named Jehoshaphat. Not a perfect leader, but he is a leader who at times had a great sensitivity to what God wanted to do. We're gonna start reading in verse one of chapter 20. It says this. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Meunites came to make war on Jehoshaphat. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming from Edom from the other side of the sea. It is already in Hazazan Tamar, that is En Gedi, Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard, and he began to pray. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of the verses, but he, he prayed a, a lamenting prayer. And he began to acknowledge who God was and the victories that God had brought in the past. But then he also came to a point where he needed to acknowledge the victory that they needed him to help them win today. And so we get down to verse 12 and he says, Oh, our God, will you not judge them, their enemies? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. All of the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them in the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance that the Lord will give you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. If you know the story, you know that the next morning, Jehoshaphat got his people ready. He didn't send out the infantry. No, he sent out the worship team. And the worship team went out ahead of everyone, and they began singing praises to God, worshiping God. Before the battle even started, they were praising the Lord, calling out on the name of the Lord. They were actually quoting Psalm 136, verse 1 calling out on the name of the Lord. And ultimately, because of their worship, 
the enemy got real confused and started killing one another. And we see that the enemies that came against God's people started killing each other, and God's people in Judah stood there and watched their enemies slaughter one another, leaving no one alive, and Israel could go and get the plunder. They saw the victory happen right in front of them, and the Lord did it. And it's so interesting if you look at what was going on in the nation around this moment, because Jehoshaphat had just recently felt the need to rededicate the nation of Judah to the Lord. He had just recently established new judges, godly judges all over the nation. He had told them, you're not judging on behalf of man, you're judging on behalf of the Lord. You're judging on behalf of God. And he was essentially attempting to walk in obedience and walk in the will of God. It's so interesting that as he was trying to realign the nation with the will of God, that is when a war of the enemy came against them. You ever found that when you're walking in the will of God, it's like an invitation for war to come to your doorstep? Have you ever found that when you're doing exactly what God wants you to do, you often find yourself facing enemies you never thought were going to show up and people you never thought were going to come out of the woodwork? I just want to encourage someone in here today. If you feel like you're walking through a really difficult season, you're walking through a dark season, and you're questioning whether you're in the will of the Lord, it might not be that you're out of God's will. It might actually be that you're in God's will. Because when we're in the will of the Lord, it invites war from the enemy. First John chapter 3 and verse 8 says that Jesus came to destroy the work of the enemy. So if we're walking with Jesus, we are building his kingdom, pushing back the kingdom of darkness. There's going to be a war. And we don't have to be discouraged thinking, are we in God's will? When we're walking in his will, there will be war. And scripture tells us that the enemy was almost there, but they were getting close. They didn't have a lot of time to prepare. Oftentimes, some of the battles that we face It just happened like that, something we never saw coming. They didn't see this coming. And Scripture tells us that Jehoshaphat was alarmed. And when I read that word alarmed in the NIV, I thought, and I wonder if it means something cool like in the Hebrew. Like I wonder if if there's any chance that this means that maybe he had an awareness or maybe he was alert or he was at the ready. No, it meant he was afraid. (laughs) You read the ESV, it says that he was afraid. You read the NLT, it says that he was terrified, that he was absolutely terrified. This is unique to me because this is a man who had just recently established these new judges around the nation, and the last thing he said to them is that you are not judging on behalf of man, but on behalf of God. He said, do so with courage. He told them to act in courage. If you read the previous chapter, he established leadership and said, act in courage. And here he is, afraid. You ever felt like on a Sunday or a Wednesday, you've told your people not to be afraid and walk in faith, but then by Monday, Tuesday, or maybe a Thursday, you were deathly afraid? You ever felt like maybe you got up on a Wednesday night talking to your kids or your your youth ministry, your young adults, and you told them, you got to start walking in faith. You cannot be afraid of other people's opinions. You, You cannot be afraid of what you don't have, right? We've all preached it. We've gone down the list. But then we wake up on a Thursday and we're terrified to the point where we almost can't even do what God called us to do. I think at times the enemy would love to lie to us and make us believe that we're an imposter because we deal with fear. He, I feel like he's, he's lying to somebody in this room this week. I don't know who you are. He's been telling you you're an imposter because you know that you've got fear in your life, but you stand up on a Sunday or Wednesday and tell people to walk by faith. Let me just encourage you. Just because we have moments of fear, it does not mean that we are an imposter. It means that we are human. And God is not caught off guard by our humanity. That is why 365 different times in Scripture, we see the words, do not fear or do not be afraid. It's as if the Lord knew we would need to be reminded to take courage every single day of the year. I'm telling you, we're going to have moments of fear. It's how we steward them that will determine what we see God do in our life. I really believe that the way we steward our moments of great fear will determine how successful we are in what God has called us to do. The question is not, will we have moments of fear? It's how will we steward them when they come? I've gotten the opportunity to be around some of the most influential leaders in Christendom. It's been such a blessing. And guess what? They have moments of fear too. But here's what I respect about our leadership. 
It's what they do when they're afraid that sets them apart. That when they do not know what to do or they are afraid, they look to the Lord. They get on their knees. They call out on the name of the Lord saying, Jesus, I need you. I need you. They focus in and they pray. Look what Jehoshaphat did. He resolved to inquire of the Lord. He was afraid, terrified, but he resolved to inquire of the Lord. It does not say that he resolved to take inventory of all of their weapons. It says he resolved to inquire of the Lord. It does not say that he resolved to start fighting. No, he resolved to start fasting. He called their nation to a fast. He sought the Lord. It was as if he was turning down the noise of an entire nation so they could tune into the voice of the Holy Spirit. A while back, my family and I were at Universal Studios here in Orlando, and uh, we, we got on a, uh, a roller coaster. My parents were there as well. And my dad gets in the roller coaster. He's in, he's in one of the carts behind me, and I'm sitting down in the coaster. And it's this roller coaster that you get in, and there's like a little screen in front of you, and there's a, there's a playlist, and you can pick songs. Some of you might have ridden this ride before. But I jumped in my seat, and I went through the playlist, and I picked a song, and it would play it in these speakers that are just in your coaster cart. It's amazing. And so I get in there and I choose this rock song. I don't even like rock music, okay? But I choose this rock song. And the music starts and I'm ready to go. And then whew, roller coaster takes off. Immediately when I get off, I start asking for the Tylenol. Like I'm at that point where when I ride a roller coaster, I start asking for Tylenol as soon as I get off. Anyone can relate? I'm like, where's the Tylenol? <laughs> we get off and I see my dad and he's like, did you see him? I said, what? He said, did, did you see him? I said, dad, what are you talking about? He said, Shaq, did you see Shaq? I said, Dad, I, that, wh what are you talking about? Like Shaquille O'Neal, Shaq? He said, yes. Did you see Shaquille O'Neal? He was standing right next to you. I said, you're talking like one of my childhood heroes, Shaquille O'Neal, played for the Orlando Magic, played for the Lakers, like one of the greatest ever. That, that Shaquille O'Neal, he said, yes. He said he was there with some family members of his. It looked like he walked in through one of the service entrances. I took off in a sprint back to the ride. I'm trying to get in through like the handicap entrance. I'm trying to go everywhere I can to see a glimpse of Shaquille O'Neal, okay? I grew up in the 90s. Shaq was the man. I wanted to see Shaq. I didn't get to see him. I get back to my family. I'm like, I can't find him. I didn't see him. I don't even believe you. He, was, he wasn't even there. You made that up. He said, I promise you he was there. I said, why didn't you tell me? He said, Austin, I was yelling your name, trying to get your attention because I knew you would want to see Shaq. I assumed you probably looked over and saw him. Nope, because the volume of the music in my coaster was way too loud for me to hear my dad's voice trying to get me to see something that he wanted me to see. Listen, when the volume of our situation is too loud, we can't even recognize a voice that we've learned to listen to for our entire life. There has to come a moment in our leadership and in the organizations and churches that we lead where we're willing to turn down the volume of the noise so we can tune into the voice of the Holy Spirit because he's got something to say to us. He's got places for us to go and things for us to do, but we've got to hear his voice. It only happens when we turn the volume down so interesting that, that we as children's and youth workers are constantly telling our students to turn the volume of social media down. What would happen if we actually did it ourselves? We're constantly telling our students to turn the volume of negative friendships and negative relationships down in their life. What would happen if we did it ourselves? We're telling them to turn the volume of other people's opinions down. What would happen if we did it? I think we'd be tuned into the voice of the Lord in a new way. We would hear what he wants us to hear. We would go where he wants us to go. We got to be a generation that inquires of the Lord. We got to get back to fasting. The Lord convicted me of this in the past week. I got to fast more. I got to spend more time with the Lord. And I was talking to my friend Peter Reeves about fasting, and I love what he says about fasting. He said it's so interesting because most people would actually rather fight than fast. He's such a good preacher. He said most people would rather fight than fast. He said, because fighting usually happens in public, but fasting often happens in private. He said, fighting happens when everybody can see it, but fasting happens when nobody can see it. What if we were a generation of leaders who said our first reaction is not going to be to fight, but it's going to be to fast, because then we call on the name of the one who can do things we could never do for ourselves. 
He inquired of the Lord. The whole nation fasted. They sought the Lord. Called out on the name of the Lord. And he prayed an incredible prayer. He acknowledged all the things that God had done, how great he was, his majesty. But then he acknowledged that they needed him now. He said, Lord, there's a vast army coming against us. We can't take on this vast army. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Think about the humility. I don't know what to do, but I know who to look at. I don't know the answer, but I know the one who actually has it. What if we got really good at saying, you know what? I really don't know, but I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to talk to the Lord about it. I'm going to spend time with my Savior, and then I'll get back to you. Sometimes I think it's just about focusing on the Lord, and he'll give us the right answer. He'll make a way, because what we focus on does determine our future. And as we see in this passage, I think it's so true that there will actually be moments and battles that, that we fight, whether it's in our family, whether it's in our church, whether it's in our finances, whatever it is, there will be moments in which the fight is actually not won because of our fight, it's won because of our focus. Where our focus is actually more important to winning the battle than our fight. February 11th, 1990, Tokyo, Japan. One of the most infamous boxing matches that ever took place. There was a a boxer named Mike Tyson, and he was facing off against a fighter named James Buster Douglas. To give you a little bit of backstory on this fight, it ended up uh, being a 42 to 1 odds that Mike Tyson was going to win. Some people think it was as high as 50 to 1 odds. That means that Mike Tyson was a lot better boxer. He was a lot better fighter than Buster Douglas. In fact, the previous fight that Mike Tyson had had, he had knocked his opponent out on the mat 90 seconds. He was undefeated. People were terrified of this man. I wasn't even old enough to watch the fight in real time, but I have watched clips of the fight. I've read articles about the fight. I have talked to tons of middle-aged pastors about the fight. <laughs> and they will be quick to tell you, Buster Douglas was not a better fighter. He wasn't even a top Five contender. Mike Tyson was number one undefeated. 42 to 1 odds. Tyson was the better fighter. He said, but in that fight, Tyson did not focus. They said he wasn't training. They said he wasn't working out. They said he wasn't working hard. He was staying out all night. He was partying. His focus was everywhere else other than where it should have been. He didn't even think that his opponent was worth training for. And because he focused on the wrong things, he actually lost to an inferior fighter when he stepped in the ring. While Buster focused on the right things, and he knocked out the champ in front of the whole world. Sometimes the battle is not won simply because of our fight, but because of our focus, who we're looking at, acknowledging that we don't have it, but God has it, acknowledging that we can't come up with it, but God already owns it, that God's ahead of us. What are we going to focus on when we're afraid? What are we going to focus on when things are against us, when we're outnumbered? I love what my friend Kendall Alfaro says. He says, fear is a terrible counselor. We don't look to fear, we look to Jesus when we are afraid, when we are outnumbered. He called out on the name of the Lord. And then scripture tells us that all the men, all the women, all the children and all the little ones were standing before the temple. All the men, all the women, all the children, all the little ones, all the adults, all the young adults, all the youth group, all the children's ministry, they were standing before the Lord. They were there in unity. So often in scripture, we see that unity has to happen before victory is even a possibility. I really believe that if we're going to win the victories that God wants us to win in the assemblies of God and around the world through Next Gen Ministry, we have to be more united than we've ever been before. We have to be on the same page. We have to be willing to gather together like this. We have to be willing to set our differences aside and say we know the Lord wants to speak to us, so we're coming together. We're seeking the Lord together so that God can do through us that which he wants to do and that which only he can do. And while unity sets people up for victory, I think the disunification of armies is often what God would do to destroy Israel's enemies. They ended up fighting each other. The prophet of the Lord came in 
after Jehoshaphat prayed and Jehaziel said, listen, you don't need to be afraid. You don't have to fear. The battle is not yours. It's God's. He says, you don't have to be afraid because the battle does not belong to you. The battle is not in your hands. It's in the hand of the Lord. This fight is not your fight. It belongs to the Lord. You need only to take your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance that the Lord is going to bring to you today. It's not your fight. It's not your fight. This is something that I absolutely had to, had to live out in my life. July 27, 2023, two days before National Youth Conference and General Council, I'm reading a book to my daughter just before bed, and she puts her head on my chest. And after the book's done, I close the book, and she gets, she gets off, off, she's laying on my chest. She gets up. It, it's kind of sore. And I'm like, man, that's kind of weird. And I feel it, and there's a lump in my chest. And immediately, I'm like, that's not normal. <laughs> and so I call my wife over. I'm like, Lauren, you need to come over here and feel this. See if this is normal. And she feels it. She's like, yeah, that's not normal. And so I immediately went to the doctor the next morning and got some ultrasounds set up and some scans set up, and they did biopsy. And, and sure enough, about a week after General Council and National Youth Conference, I was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. I had to have a mastectomy on my left side. I didn't even know dudes could get a mastectomy. <laughs> like, and I'm skinny. Like, come on. I'm like, I'm like, I didn't even know this was possible. The surgeon's like, trust me, buddy, it's possible. Got a mastectomy on my left side. And after that, I, I found out that I had to have uh, chemotherapy for, for three months. I think we might have some pictures of, of, of that, that journey. That was my first, first round of chemo. You can just kind of scroll through some of those. and It was the most difficult journey I've ever been through. It was the, it was the sickest I've ever been, the most pain that I've ever felt. Uh, many of you in this room have probably either experienced it yourself or you know someone who has, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody. There were, there were nights where I was passing out in, in my bathroom over the sink. My wife can attest to that. There were nights where I got hardly any sleep because I was in pain head to toe. There were side effects that I didn't even know were a thing, and, and sure enough, they were. I mean, it was crazy. I would call a few friends of mine who had been through cancer to just say, hey, is, is this normal? This is crazy. I've never experienced anything like this. In the middle of all this, my wife gives birth to our third child. Right, so we're going through that while going from two to three, and the jump from two to three, crazy. <laughs> Like, we need the Lord. <laughs> We're tired. I'm going through this journey, and I remember that when I found out I had cancer, I started texting the staff, and I started texting some of my bosses and pastors in my life and just letting them know, hey, this is, this is what's going on. I have cancer. The Lord is faithful. God's going to use this. But I would end every text by saying, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight. God's going to be faithful. He's going to use this, but I'm going to fight. And so I started eating as healthy as I could. I mean, I cut out every bit of sugar you can think of. I mean, I was extra disciplined. I called my friend Steve Zaboda, and I'm like, look, I'd love to be able to run a half marathon before I start my chemo. We got two weeks. Can you help get me in better shape? I already had a baseline running, but not a half marathon. And, and so sure enough, he comes alongside of me, and he gets me in better shape. I'm like wanting to fatigue my body to get used to the fatigue. And I'm just doing all of these different things to try and prepare myself for what I was about to walk into as I went into chemo. But I'll never forget the morning I was texting my friend, Jonathan Rivera. We were just sending encouraging messages back and forth. He was telling me that he was praying for me. And that morning in my Bible reading, the scripture I read was 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And it was a reminder that the battle is not yours. It is the Lord's. And from that day forward, the narrative changed. And the text messages I would send, they, they didn't say, I'm going to fight. They would say, it's not my fight. This battle is the Lord's. This doesn't belong to me. Yes, I've got a part to play, but the battle and victory are not mine to get. They are the Lord's, and I believe that God is going to do it. Not because of who I am, but because of who he is and what he's capable of. It wasn't my fight. And it was a process, week in, week out of going through this sickness but I had to deal with this, realizing there's so much that's out of my control. I'm going to trust the only one who actually has the power to do what I need done in my situation. And my scans have come back clean recently, and we're praising God for that. It's amazing, absolutely. He's a miracle-working God. If the worship team could come, that would be great. But I had to get to a point where I was just honest about the fact that this is not my fight. 
Can I just be super vulnerable with you? This is a nine-page packet about intravenous cancer treatment education, a nine-page packet of side effects, a nine-page packet of all of the things that I was going to have to look forward to, a nine-page packet telling me how sick that I was going to be and, and some of the risks that were involved and why I was going to have to get more blood work and all of these things. And when I got this packet, I'll never forget sitting in that doctor's office, the oncology office, just thinking, this absolutely looks like my fight. <laughs> there are pages of side effects, things I never even thought that I would have to think about or walk through. It certainly felt like my fight. But God was so faithful to remind me that the victory lies with him. And while Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 31 does say that we're to ready the horses for the day of battle, follows it up by saying, but victory rests with the Lord. I had to understand that God was less concerned with me readying the horses and he was more concerned with me readying my heart and getting prepared to walk through what I was about to walk through. And I don't believe that was just a word for me. I believe that is a word for us because so oftentimes as a leader, we try and take it into our own hands. We try to build a new system. We try to have a new strategy. We try to do a new event. We try to do a new discipleship pathway, whatever it might be. All of those things are great. They're phenomenal and we need them. But there are certain moments in which it does not matter if we've readied the horses because our hearts are not ready. They're not prepared. And I think God is saying to leadership, let's get our hearts right. Let's get before the Lord. Let's fast again. Let's call on the name of the Lord. Believing his Holy Spirit will empower us and we'll see the victory won in our life. It may not come with someone being healed that we're praying for the way we want it to happen. That's the reality of it. I knew there was a reality that things might not turn out the way I wanted. That was a very real reality that I had to grapple with. But every day I knew, regardless of the outcome, not my fight, not my fight, not my fight, not my fight. The battle is the Lord's, it's not my fight. Even when I didn't believe it, the battle is the Lord's, it's not my fight. When I didn't feel it, I'm still saying it today. Just stand to your feet all over this place. If it was up to me, I would rather not talk about the cancer. I'd rather not talk about all of that. I'd rather just exposit a passage and Let's pray together and be filled up and then we'll go. But I, I really sensed through this process and I, and I talked to Pastor Jay about it months ago, I really sensed that, that this is what God wanted me to talk about in this moment. And I don't think I'm the only one in this room. I know we have flights to catch. I know we have places to be. But I know I'm not the only one in this room who has a battle in their life that they have been trying to fight on their own. And I really believe the Lord is saying, look, you don't have all the muscles that you need to carry this right now. Let me do it. You don't have all the weapons you need to fight this enemy. Let me do it on your behalf. And I don't think God's asking us to be lazy leaders, but I do think he's asking us to be listening leaders who would say, God, what is it that you do want me to do? What are you asking me to say? How are you asking me to move forward? Because I don't know what to do. So God, I'm looking to you. I don't have the strength, but God, I know that you do. And if you're in this place and you know there's a battle in your life, it might seem small, it might seem monumental, but you know the Lord wants to fight a battle on your behalf. You can sense it in the spirit right now. If that's you, just begin to come find a place to pray. All over this room, if that's you, we're going to give some things to the Lord. We ask our students and children to do it all the time. It's not your fight. Let God do the heavy lifting. He wants to do for you what you cannot do for himself. It's no accident that there's been such an emphasis on prayer and a focus on getting before the Lord. I really sense that God is just looking for a generation of leaders who would get before the Lord and say, God, we don't know what to do. We don't want some other option. We don't want some other strategy. Those things are great, but we need the power of the Holy Spirit and the direction of his guidance each and every day in our life. God, we need you. Oh God, right now I'm praying specifically 
for those parents who are in the room who have a sick child at home and they've been trying to take care of things in their own power. They've been trying to take care of the issues in their own knowledge and with their own finances. In Jesus' name right now, we submit our children to you. We submit our kids to you. God, the problem that our kids are facing, whether it's health, whether it's with friends at school, whatever it might be, in Jesus' name, we're submitting that to you, believing you're going to fight the battle for our daughter. You're going to fight the battle for our son. You're going to fight the battle for them that we cannot fight, even though we wish we could and we wish we were strong enough. We recognize that we're not, but only you are. God, we're submitting them to you in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God, to that financial issue that we're walking through, we've been stressed and anxious the whole week. We've been here knowing what our finances are like. In Jesus' name, we're asking that you would bring increase and you would bring wisdom to handle finances and you would bring provision and you would bring open doors and generous people who would step up and say, I believe in you and your family. We're going to bless you in Jesus' name. God, to those of us who are dealing with a health issue in our own body, in Jesus' name, we're giving this to you because this is not our battle to fight. We're trusting you with it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we're asking for that leader who's had issues with their eyesight. In Jesus' name, would you clear up his or her eyes right now by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, to that leader who's been dealing with back pain and they're dreading even getting on the plane or in the car today. In Jesus' name, would you heal his or her back right now by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, to that leader who's been dealing with diabetes. In Jesus' name, would you heal the diabetes right now by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, we know that you can. We're asking that you would. We're asking that you would humbly, we're asking that you would do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And whether it's an organizational problem we're trying to solve in our church or, or in our ministry, in Jesus' name, would you give the wisdom that we need? God, would you open the door that we need? Would you send the volunteers? Would you send the leaders? Would you send the right people? Oh God, this is not our fight. It's your church. It's your church, and we know that you're going to build it. We're just glad we get to be a part of it. God, the battle belongs to you. The battle belongs to you. The battle belongs to you, so we're worshiping in advance. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. specifically for that leader who's been feeling like they're an imposter because they get up on a Wednesday or Sunday and they challenge people to live a life of faith, but they've been walking in fear. In Jesus' name, God, would you give them boldness right now by the power of your Holy Spirit? Would you give them confidence? Would you remind him or her that you have called them, that you have placed them? God, remind them that you are the lifter of our head, that you are our champion, our defender, the everlasting one. Give a boldness. Give a boldness where there's been a fear in Jesus' name. He is not an imposter. She's not an imposter. He or she just needs to call on you. Just needs to call on you. God, to that leader who's had a lot of trouble turning down the noise in his or her life, maybe it is something as trivial as social media. Maybe it's something much bigger, like a, a negative voice from someone else on the staff at their church. In Jesus' name, I'm asking, would you help them to have the wherewithal to turn down the volume of that noise so they can hear your voice, so they can hear your direction, so they can hear your leadership? Oh God, would we be a people willing to fast? Would we be a people willing to seek you? Would we be a people willing to ask you to help us, knowing that we don't have what it takes? God, would you humble us? Would you humble us, O oh Lord? We need you, Jesus. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted up. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I see. Hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. 
Precisava pai no matter what we come against you've already won the battle and God we are so privileged so thankful that we have a mighty warrior that we serve and we praise you and we acknowledge you and we oh God being surrounded by armies of angels and surrounded by great clouds of witnesses before us and who have gone before us and God we make our pledge to you again as sons and daughters called into your kingdom Lord we pledge our souls our hearts our lives, our talents, our resources, our identity and understanding of being your children. Lord, we don't own anything. You own it all. And what little bit we think we do have, we know that you've given to us to steward. And Lord, we make this fresh pledge again to you today we are all in on what you've called us to do we are all in on what you've called us to do oh god we praise you we praise you lord i thank you for what you've done and what you're going to continue to do and lord we give you praise. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise in here. Come on, we're on the winning side. He's already won the battle. He's already set forth the harvest. Oh God, use your servants. Rise up, servants of the Lord. Be what God's called you to be. Do what God's called you to do. Be like Jesus to a generation. All in for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Come on, shout to him again. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we sing to you. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. somebody a high five on the right and the left and say let's go baby come on you don't you don't have to move you don't have to go anywhere hang tight for just a second superintendent Doug Clay general superintendent Doug Clay would you join me please for a moment would you show your appreciation to our general superintendent Oh, we love you, Pastor. We love you so much. Pastor, 
I want to say a few things. If you'll allow me to speak for us for a minute, is that okay? Is that okay? Pastor, we believe that the Lord has spoken to us this week in these three days. The first day, what I heard the Lord say to us is that we can't do this on our own. The weight of what's before this generation is too much. And we have to have the inspiration and the insight and the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. We also know that at times we find ourselves at moments as leaders in our fellowship saying, why am I doing this? I can't do this, but I get to do this. And that I've got to do that on my knees because it's not my fight. We pledge to you. We know that God's given you a great responsibility of leading this great fellowship. It's got a 85 million global community. And we're saying to you as next gen leaders here, General Superintendent Doug Clay, we are all in with you. We are all in. Wow, thank you. I would just say in the Assemblies of God, we look at students as not the church of tomorrow, but very much the church of today. And I want to thank you, Next Gen Laviers, for using the students to become the solutions, not to perpetuate the problem. I believe in this room there's a lot of divine solutions that are going to take place in culture and in society because when all of the societal iconic institutions are shifting, educational, religious, political, family, I'm thankful that the church remains solid. The church remains there. So thank you for what you are going to do to see a healthy church in every community that's marked by spiritual and numerical growth and to see a generation of young people come in and just maybe our generation will be the generation that completes the great commission. Come on, I want you to lift both hands heavenward right now. Everybody all over the room, lift both hands heavenward, would you? And Father, I pray your canopy of blessing over every leader, over everyone who has an influence on the hearts and the minds of the next generation. Would you empower them with divine anointing to be able to release that student body into a fulfillment of your call like we've never seen before. So as your people, we give ourselves to you to see the greatest revival we've ever seen in church history and start it in us individually and use our influence to perpetuate it. I pray these things in the strong, strong name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, give Jesus a hand clap of praise. Awesome. Hey, take a look at the video screen as a recap of these days.
anywhere about the gospel. came up here on the stage to tell you how much we respect and love you and how thankful we are that we get to do this with you. You're amazing leaders called of God. Come on, stand up. Called of God. You get up at 4.30 in the morning on a Sunday morning and you pour out your heart to the Lord one more time. You go into that children's church. And you kiss and hug on some snotty-nosed kids. And you give them Jesus. You, you welcome kids in from a long day on a Wednesday. And they've gone through war at school and war at home and there's someone there waiting on them that says I've got a big hug for you welcome God loves you I love you Jesus has a plan for your life you walk them through journeys some of you as youth pastors all the way to the moment of a graduation some of them don't know where they're going to go or what they're going to do. And you say, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you because God's got a plan. And he's going to show you. You do that day in, day out. You do it for less than what you're worth. Don't worry. You're going to get your reward. But we get to do this. And on behalf of this team... We want to say we're all in with you. We are with you. We are for you. And I know that you're feeling the same even for us. Because we all belong to the Lord. Even our kids belong to the Lord. They're not ours. We're just raising them up until they produce a next generation. We all have these great privileges in front of us I pray that when you return back to your home you'll kiss your spouse you'll kiss your daughter and your son you'll embrace your church you'll walk up to your pastor and say pastor I'm all in I know that we have a, a situation going on in this 21st century of 2024 but God is the victor, and we're on that team. But before we put a benediction on this, people who know me well know that I'm a geek. And... Uh, <laughs> and... 
One of my favorite geek moments is one more thing. And U.S. Missions is all in with you. Malcolm Berlay, what you guys do in embracing the mission of God to the primary and secondary school campus and the university campuses of our nation are phenomenal. The impact of that, only heaven can tell the whole story. But you have vested yourselves as leaders, as a network, as an agency to send missionary movements. And in a sense, in a way, we are a bit of missionary movement to an unchurched world. And on behalf of U.S. Missions, we're excited to be able to say to you, everybody gets a copy of this resource from Lee Rogers. Because we want to win at ministry to the next generation. Thank you, U.S. Missions. Thank you, leaders. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. See you in 2026. Let's go. Thank you.